Hello. Um, I hope you're all of you keeping safe and well. Uh, interesting times. Um, very pleased to be joining you uh, for this event. My name's John O'Connor uh, and I'm the chair and project lead for the school bus project. And in the background, uh, you could probably see uh, an image of our original big yellow bus, uh, big yellow as we call it. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our project and then uh, see if some of you may be interested in finding out more. Um, and some of you may even um, take some personal action um, in the context of what is still a continuing crisis for refugees and displaced persons. And as, as a sort of rough idea of what we're going to talk about or what I'm going to take you through, um, I'll give you a brief introduction to uh, who we are, the charity, um, what we've done in the past and the situation that we respond to and where we've got to in uh, early 2021. So I hope that'll be of interest. Um, I'm going to dodge about a bit and try and use uh, screen sharing uh, to add other bits while I talk. And some of the material is taken from a series of webinars uh, that we did, I think, in the latter part of last year. So here we go, the famous share screen, um, going to our desktop. And I'm going to start with um, just playing you a very short promotion video. It's a little bit of information that will give you a feel for life back in Calais, the jungle, some time ago. Um, so here is Big Yellow getting ready to go on its journey um, across from the UK, sponsored by a passionate group of educators, uh, ironically, <laughs> grand music there, a group of educators who were based in Brighton originally. They got together, bought the Big Yellow Bus, and we took this over. Right, let's just start again. Not happy with that. Okay, so here is a short movie um, based on the work of Big Yellow um, with um, some images to give you an idea of what it was like working with uh, refugees, displaced persons in Northern France, particularly Calais. Um, the project originated in Brighton. Uh, a group of educators looked over the channel at the peak of uh, the fairly well-known uh, jungle uh, settlement uh, with many communities from Sudan, Syria, Afghanistan, and more besides. Big Yellow Bus served in the original jungle, and then in 2018, we went back with a team, including Little Green, which you can see there in the background. And this is uh, a classic big school bus project activity with young people. Um, the classes ranging anywhere from three months, three month old children who've been born in northern France in the midst of chaos, uh, through the primary age range, up into teens, uh, up into adult education. It included recreation, music, uh, exercises like this one, dreams. We worked through all kinds of conditions including bitter weather, significant aggression, um, exercises that are often ironic, comparatives, um, better, happier and so on. We celebrated as a team, uh, we worked together, involved in partnerships with other agencies and exhibitions, but at the heart of it is that principle of learning as part of your identity 
Um, we believe absolutely that you have the UN Declaration of Rights. We've had support for those principles from all sorts of people at festivals and gatherings and community activism, jewelry makers um, and uh, craft workers um, for all sorts of reasons. This is a shot of our recent project in Samos on the Greek island there, a place called The Nest, working with education teams like Action for Education. And this year was our fifth birthday, uh, 2020. This little screen shows some of the data and statistics. So that's where that little clip of film comes to an end. Um, so going back to some of the things that you might want to know, it's, it's a registered charity. As I said, it began in Brighton with a group of educators and in a fairly ad hoc way, um, moved into the idea of mobile learning provision. Uh, we supported teams, we built up teams of ed volunteer educators and managed and developed their abilities from backgrounds of teaching, youth service, social care, educational psychology, uh, all sorts of uh, skills that we brought together. And typically we'd have a team in uh, our Northern France work of anywhere from four to 10. Those teams would go out, as you've seen from that short movie, into very basic situations, literally scrubland, because that's where refugee communities were settling, trying to be settled. But as is the case up to date today, late January 2021, the state of France and the state of the United Kingdom um, have worked hard to create what in the UK has been known as the hostile environment, the desire to resist and push back displaced persons, disregarding at times uh, international law, which provides for asylum seekers to arrive in a country and state uh, their request for security um, and a place of safety. Um, I won't go for the moment into too much detail on the current policy framework, but I'm sure that you'll be aware, many of you, that it is indeed hostile. Um, I'm speaking to you actually from our bus project office base uh, down in Folkestone, which is where the photo behind me was taken. And we are obviously just a matter of a few hundred meters from the English Channel or La Manche, if you're seeing it from the other side. And it's always a good thing to see anything from two sides at least. So on a daily basis, currently, and for the last two or three, four, five years, there have been those who have traveled thousands of miles from their home or country of, of origin. They will have been moved by uh, causes such as warfare, famine, drought, economic disaster, um, personal crisis to leave what was originally a place of security at one point in their lives. And the journeys they have made are quite epic, um, terrifying, disturbing. Um, we have met and worked with people who have literally crossed the Sahara Desert and come out the other side smaller in number than the group that entered that region. Uh, I remember distinctly working with a young person of 10 who on his own made the way from Afghanistan. He gave me a geography lesson of I think 16 or 17 countries he'd, he had traveled through, crossed over um, various attempts to enter into Europe before ending up with us in the school, the school bus project in Calais. Age 10, he lived fiercely uh, in an independent way, um, emerging actually quite often in temperatures of minus five, minus six from something resembling a gorse bush to get on board, shake himself down and look worried about us and say, how are you doing? You, you look tired, are you okay? And he fended off um, advances from predatory adults, uh, from traffickers, from competitors for his small pitch in a bit of scrubland where he was 
uh, coping with assortments of tarpaulins and tents and pieces of material provided for him, like many other refugees, by the collective that we joined in Calais called L'Auberge, eight organisations providing help in various forms. Um, we were the learning provider, um, refugee uh, community kitchen provided meals and food to the best of their ability and continue to do so as we speak. Uh, refugee info bus provided access to communications, satellite live from the middle of nowhere back to the middle of nowhere at home. Um, we worked with refugee youth service very closely who looked over the options for safeguarding and rights entitlement within the French system for young people and so on and so forth, a collective. So our young friend learned with us, continued his learning journey and demonstrated an extraordinary um, ability and level of learning predeceding his time with us. I'm gonna pause and I'm going to share a screen here, which is a set of slides, which will help perhaps give a bit more structure to some of what I'm saying, but I hope it's giving you a flavour of what the project has been about. Rooted in human rights, we use the strap line frequently of Article 26, which is Article 26 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and we have been involved in direct provision. As we go on, I'll just give you an update which says that we've moved from direct provision into partnership work and strategic. But first, let's see if we can have a look at a series of slides, which should come up if we're lucky here. There we go. Um, I won't actually play the song, although I strongly recommend it. Tracy Chapman's version of Bob Dylan, Times They Are Changing, seems like a really appropriate soundtrack to 2021. Um, this particular section of the talk I'm providing for you, as I said, it's one we've delivered to universities before. We see universities, higher education, as sites of community resilience and international solidarity. The academic and the learning context uh, provides um, a really important platform for considering the issues of refugee rights. We, we use the program uh, umbrella title of Unified, for obvious reasons. So what is Unified? Uh, firstly, it's that concept of solidarity. I think it also for us represents the opportunity for reflection, analysis and research. We want to be engaged with higher education to support practice in refugee learning provision and pedagogy. And to do that, you obviously will, all of you I'm sure, embrace a, a consciousness of history, politics, and various ideas and issues. There are links with other work and social movements such as STAR, um, which is a university movement. Um, if you haven't heard of her, it's worth looking up Baroness Helena Kennedy, who is a vociferous champion of human rights. Uh, she's a long-standing friend of the School Bus Project and has set up her own Article 26 Foundation supporting refugee access to higher education. So the idea behind Unified, which you know, we're, we're opening up to yourselves, is we want to have a network of universities working alongside the BUS project who will help us raise awareness, funds wherever possible for education-based projects, such as one we'll explain in a little bit more detail in Greece, the Greek islands, etc. And, and I think students at any age, any stage, and in any studies would be involved in uh, such networks in their own communities. Um, mentioned briefly already where we come from, the genesis of the project and the work in jungle, but as I said, it's a Brighton. Uh, Brighton is one of our homes. Um, we do have a priority, a core priority of children and young people, um, but we work with all age groups and we believe strongly that this is about empowerment, it's not philanthropy, and, and that means working with. So many of the refugee community members we've met are actually teachers themselves, they're educators, they're highly qualified. Um, we think that the whole drive from here going forward is about building capacity um, and you'll have seen uh, some of that 
film material. Um, this is another little clip which shows us actually on a daily journey. There goes the bus. Goodness me. Here's one of our drivers, which is um, you know a, a large number of people. Uh, this actually is a film that lasts a few minutes. So some data. 26 million, the number keeps going up. It hasn't diminished. The crisis is not going away. Um, I doubt if it will go away in my lifetime or yours. Um, some of the team welcoming people on board the bus, as I said, they used to be more worried about us than we were about them. Um, here's a student doing a flag. We looked at everyday sessions on biology. Let's just bring the sound and up. Ages and the levels that we have. Downstairs, we have more of a social space for the refugees to chill out, charge their phones, play chess, play um, cards. We're providing a really, really important role. So moving back from that, um, it's now going to go relentlessly round in a circle, isn't it? Of course it is. Uh, let me just get back to... Back to the slideshow. Here we go. Yeah, slight glitches technology. So thinking about the context we're working in, I'm in a rapidly changing world, information, data, statistics, um, absolutely blitzing us, information overload, particularly during the pandemic. So what we're reflecting on as an organization, and, and I think part of this conversation is geopolitical convulsions. Great phrase, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a new type of indigestion. Um, I think it's a genuine, a, a useful phrase, perhaps a shorthand for describing events in the United States where the, the context and the narrative over four years has been aggressive, insular, isolated, disconnected. However, that's galvanized a significant proportion of the population to share a worldview that is polarized and at one end of the extreme of humanitarian instinct. instinct. And in the UK, we're not um, immune from uh, either a virus or from those convulsions which divide us. Uh, the story of Brexit without spending long on it has shown an absolute polarization of those who feel we belong to a wider world or within a wider context and those who don't. So a convulsion, a short verse for it, short phrase for it. And I think what we've got um, currently going on is a series of movements that recognize global issues. Many people then personally identify or indirectly, you have a voice that's come through. And I'm, I'm using just two examples of how we're rethinking, many of us, rethinking how the world works, the interconnectivity of different issues. So Greta Thunberg, inspirational, um, one of the first people to use the phrase, we're in this together and fascinating and, and driving uh, metaphors. This house is on fire. Um, and phrases like the next urgency. Black Lives Matter, um, you know, the, the situation in the States um, reawoken, um, the United States reawoken to the urgency of disparity, inequality. Um, and in this country, the, the extraordinary dialogue of um, do we want a society which is segregated, uh, unequal uh, through institutional racism, uh, through a refusal to accept, to understand or embrace uh, diversity and ability and talent, recognizing identity 
as it is, not as we would wish to see it necessarily or not in our own perspectives or our own prejudicial perspective. And, and it's, um, you know, it's good to actually look at um, sources such as Spike Lee, you know, filmmaker who, whose response to the killing of George Floyd was put into a short film. Three Brothers recommend it if you haven't yet had the chance to look at that. So in a, in a, in a strange world, so social distancing, I think there are three paradoxes which I would connect with the way that the school bus project operates our philosophy and our vision. Um, there's an apparent proximity because we have social media, instant news, 10 seconds after hearing about an incident on the other side of the world, we might have a viewpoint. 20 seconds later, we express that. Within 30 seconds, we have an argument, which breeds a bit of alienation. It's a very reactive uh, condition. It's a very um, sort of strange way of communicating that is impersonal, but has colossal impact at the same time. Um, so I think all of those things, um, we've found connection with universities in a number of specific uh, fields of training and, and professional development, social care, education, research, and of course that underlying issue of access to higher education and equality. Um, for refugees, the access to higher education is negligible. Um, they face barriers even once in a settled status to get through the qualifying um, conditions um, of demonstrating uh, competencies through whichever system in the UK, obviously uh, trying to access through further education or GCSEs or A-levels and so on. Um, so we, we, I think we've covered this in what I've said already that you know, there are um, elements of international policy development that we want to challenge going forward. Uh, to do so, we, you know, we are inviting uh, personal interest and moral purpose. We, I think that there is an opportunity for intellectual growth for individuals and centers of excellence and academic research, action research. I'll pause before doing another slide and just briefly mention with, and, and offer further information for anybody interested. Going forward in 21, I think the School Bus Project is looking at two key areas of activity. We are less involved in direct delivery because of coronavirus and the situation in Europe, also complicated by Brexit and the new relationship between the UK and Europe. What we have done is continue support work in the Greek islands. In the north of Greece, we have a, a, a wonderful little partnership with Habibi Works. If you look them up, H-A-B-I-B-I, -I, Habibi Works, and a little carpentry project. So we have a vehicle we provided to her BB works that uh, scuttles around some of the refugee camps in northwestern Greece around Ioannina. Um, Katsikas camp is one of those and the project is very simply almost an Ikea uh, fold up woodwork bench provided into a, a, a camp or a refugee community where there will be chippies and carpenters and DIY people so they're taken through a basic program of this is how you can use the workbench, which is kitted out with all the tools you'd expect. And then it's left there. So there's a program of self-managed uh, skills redevelopment, identity being sustained, cultural relevance and so on. So our program going forward will continue to have those partnerships, but we are currently developing this concept of core. C-O-R-E, Centres of Refugee G Education. And the idea behind that is that the myriad organisations who go out and support refugees in various ways, whether that be health, uh, well-being, um, stress and, and trauma management, um, food, basic essentials, rudimentary shelter, support, advocacy, in, in, a, in sometimes a, a bleaker mode, all of us in the bus project team feel that we've been um, a sort of a rotating box of elastoplast. We, we arrive, we will support, we will make provision to the best of our ability in the most challenging of circumstances. And I say that as somebody who's been in teaching for 45 years, I've worked in many communities which had significant challenge in the UK, nothing nothing compares with the challenge for somebody of any age 
who has no secure shelter, no certainty of food, no emotional um, resilience other than what they are able to drag from the depths of their experience and hold together um, and very few actual rights, despite what international law might say. So the idea behind core of these centers of refugee education is that there is a, a need now for a, a paradigm shift, a complete scaling up of all the small agencies, the NGOs, the third sector and volunteers, thousands of wonderful people actually, who give their time generously, their skills and their humanity to a clear and very, very uh, enormous scale of need. And you will have seen, I don't need to complete you know, the picture by reiterating the journeys, the trauma of those who've lost their lives, uh, trying to reach safety and security. But the idea is that we need to actually persuade major players. Some of the potential players could be um, state actors, it could be that a national effort or a European effort, but perhaps going beyond that into outfits such as um, UNHCR, we are preparing to press the case that there should be strategic centers of expertise, need analysis, coordination, uh, administration and support in partnership with the NGO and the third sector. Um, so that there is a consistency and a sustainability and a quality assurance for learning provision. And by learning, of course, I mean, I, I suppose I've taken it as read that the definition is very broad ranging. Learning for us in the bus project is cradle to the grave. Um, it's about identity. It is about who you are. It's about affirming human instinct, curiosity, aspiration, hope. So think about those things for us and let's talk further, core. Um, Sheffield Helm University, I'm just using as a quick case study where we've done some quite remarkable work together. We've had students on placements. Um, realistically, we're not in a position to offer that currently because of the circumstances I've said. But we worked over you know, two years um, working with groups of students who became embedded in our team, we're given professional support, pastoral support, and have seen their experience embedded into the provision at Sheffield Hallam on some of their coursework, including training for uh, social care and other careers. Um, a number of different elements within that university, and if you go to their website, you'll be able to see more about what they're doing and might consider some of the similar activities that I'm sure that your university is also involved in. Um, it basically comes down to a partnership. It was about shared values. Uh, one of our team is now an associate lecturer and uh, works with Sheffield Town. So various elements of how that came about, university engagement, looking at studies, supported workshops, uh, networks and support groups and a longer term relationship. Those, those I think are the main elements of what Unified um, has been about and what we're continuing to be interested in developing as a network in the UK and beyond. Um, where are we now? If I move the little picture across that side. Um, COVID-19, it, it, I, I think I've said this already, but it, it really is the most significant marker you either accept that we are united by common interest as a global community, or perhaps you're living in, in a parallel universe. And I'm sorry if that sounds a little harsh, but that, that is my view. I don't think it's easy to escape <coughs> that concept of global connectivity. I think we have shared elements with the climate change agenda in that there is generation coming through, and, and I'm probably not talking about an age generation, so much as a communications generation, a technological generation, who now have information, access, and a shared literal view. We can have direct sight into the experience of other people, including refugee communities around the world. And therefore that brings the need for careful research and analysis, not knee-jerk 
uh, judgmental positions, but looking at the bridge building that's possible between mainstream and marginalized communities economically, politically, and in logistical terms. So moving on, I'm pushing my face around the screen here. Um, it's reflective practice, that's what education is. Um, I think it brings those international solidarity and resilience movements together. It actually references some elements in Black Lives Matter because there is clearly uh, perhaps an undertone of xenophobia, if not outright racism, in some responses to uh, displaced persons and refugees. Um, the Ra Festival mentioned it was a fun event last September, uh, went online uh, for about eight hours of solidarity, music from all sorts of sources and genre. Um, I think it's still up there if you want to have a look and find it. So that's basically the conversation around um, the Unified program. I think probably I'd wrap up um, and conclude with just a few small things for you to reflect on and think about, if you will. Um, what I've tried to set out in this talk is an introduction to the BUS project, our genesis, our sort of your beginnings, some of the work we've been involved in. There's an awful lot more I could show and share. Um, I've referenced probably two or three key elements. It's work that is about relationships. It is about humanity. It's about a global condition of inequality. Those of us that do have security now, at some point in our lives experience insecurities, whether that is in psychological terms, emotional or stress or relationship, or poverty, shortages. On all of those grounds, I suggest we have a lot in common with those who are extreme examples of the dispossessed. And those who have had experience, there may be some listening now who know very, very intimately the experience of being displaced or refugee status and having had to leave situations that were untenable, unsafe, unsurvivable. I think the key message is just to wind up with. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to contribute to the event and to share with you what we've been involved in for over five years now. Um, going forward, as I say, there will be two strands. One is the core concept, and we really would welcome any support for that uh, involvement. There'll be more to find out from our website, uh, details coming up at the end. The second strand is going to be continuing work through Unified. We want to engage with and work with universities. And alongside that is a, a, a school age program called School Friends, where we work to develop awareness, engagement, understanding in primary and secondary schools. Anything else that you need to know, um, we'd be very happy if um, you wanted to get in touch. We're going to put up email and contact details at the end. Um, I wish you well. Stay safe. Stay involved. Thank you. <laughs>